you'll recall here we have people living at homes which are going to be scattered in this geographic area. There's parks and supermarkets and grocery stores where supermarkets and grocery stores vie for their food attentions. And uh, over time, they go and um, uh, patronize the food, the grocery stores and the uh, convenience stores variously and build up a larder, which they consume with some gusto at home. Um, and uh, here, I'm, I'm just going to uh, emphasize a little bit more some of the geographic um, components of the model. Uh, and specifically, I, I want to remind you that the location of the parks here um, are based on geographic data. Location of the grocery stores and the um, convenience stores, um, respectively, are, are also based in geographic data. More than that, the, the movement of these Weeble-like um, individuals here um, uh, is, is geographically um, motivated or informed in the sense that they move around um, on networks of, of, of streets. And uh, as it turns out, we could set them to um, to use footpaths or set them to use uh, uh, to use mechanisms uh, such as public transit or what have you, uh, if we were if we were careful. Um, so if we added some logic to it. Um, so so here, in terms of kind of people's toing and froing, um, they're actually moving along um, uh, looping along corridors, thoroughfares that are shaped by mode of travel and by, um, and by the geographic environment. And it's using GIS databases for that. You could see this one went up here and kind of jogged in this dog leg um, along that street and, and, and so on. Um, and of course, this induced some, some emergent dynamics up here, et cetera, but Really, our, our focus is on this interface. And I, I just want to highlight for you, if you, you, go in, you go down Main and you were to go sort of select this, um, this item here, and I'll, I'll drag the properties window over here to the right so you can see it. Okay, this is not, not showing the, the currently selected item here. Um, you notice that uh, this is, is showing Melbourne, uh, Australia there. Um, and it's making use of routing information from an open street map server, um, actually from a, any logic server. Um, and and it, the road type is car. So we could have them instead going via foot or via bike, et cetera. Um, and uh, there's some additional features um, uh, associated with with some added resources that you can uh, make use of and that relate to sort of querying uh, databases um, for for resources such as the presence of a physician's office or what have you. Um, so this is reflecting a uh, a use of of geographic information. Um, so this is one, one model uh, that we saw. I want to try loading in another model, too. Um, and this one as well, I've, I've provided to you. Uh, so specifically, it's, it's a model that involves uh, gonorrhea and chlamydia. Um, and I'm not, OK, this is. Uh, puzzling here. I'm, I'm actually not seeing it. I was certain that I had posted it just this morning. So if I haven't, uh, I soon will. And give me a moment here. Right. And this is um, version 10 of this here. Um, so it's uh, CT, uh, chlamydia trachomatis, um, 
in this area, gonorrhea, so that's chlamydia and gonorrhea, with network dynamics version 10, no reified communities. And um, let's hope this this time it, it sticks. And yeah, it says it's there, so I'm not not sure what's what's going on. Maybe I just didn't see it in my quasi-febrile state. Um, so here it is, okay. So if you wanna get that, um, and this one I've omitted um, some features uh, uh, that are normally packaged up with it. So I can't ensure that it will run for you, um, but I will, I will, oh, oh sorry. Um, I will seek to, to make use of this um, in ways that uh, will, be, will be useful on my side. Uh, so this shows a model where we have uh, individuals. Uh, these individuals uh, uh, are susceptible to multiple types of STIs, not surprisingly, chlamydia and gonorrhea. Um, they have um, a certain care-seeking state, um, and uh, they can uh, engage in sexual activity, which, which transmits this behavior. Uh, according to a certain contact rate, and they have sexual contact. And we keep track of uh, longitudinal information, such as the count of times they've been infected. Uh, their particular networks, if you go up to, actually, you go up to, um, uh, to community here, uh, excuse me, go up to main here. I think here we, we, uh, we're, we're not putting people explicitly in populations, but in Maine for reasons that um, I won't get into. But um, here we, uh, we have people uh, who, are, who are placed uh, within the, the population uh, as a whole. And those individuals uh, have a network, I believe set by, and I'd have to go back and double check this, but it's a distance-based network with connection range 25. Okay, um, and, uh, and so uh, we're having people connected with others nearby in geographic space uh, in particular. So uh, here people are presented and they can present for care to an STI clinic, which can treat those individuals um, but which are limited by the availability of healthcare workers and uh, can engage in, in, in treatment on site. Uh, if we add more uh, time, we'd probably represent partner assisted therapy, which is one of these network mediated interventions that I could have mentioned in my networks lecture, but basically it gives antibiotics uh, for partners to the person who comes to the STI clinic. So. If, it, if only one of the partners comes to STI clinic, they are given antibiotics to deliver to sexual partners who might have been exposed through sexual interactions with that person. Um, in any case, um, the selection of clinics by an individual here is based on their distance to the nearest, uh, nearest clinic. And, uh, I don't know that I'll, I'll go into this in detail, but um, when they go, oh, we also have safe sex practices, incidentally, which affect both diseases. Um, but when they, uh, when they go to the clinic, they're going to go to the nearest clinic, uh, which is, um, uh, which is uh, determined through the GIS data uh, associated with the model. So this nearest clinic, will go whoa, um, nearest clinic. If we search for it here, we will find that it is, right, um, uh, uh, right, um, okay. And the nearest clinic finds the nearest clinic among the clinics within this GIS space. So here we're querying, um, the database and uh, for what's the nearest clinic, and we're going to be heading there. Um, and as a result, they 
they then move to that nearest clinic for care. And if we have a localized outbreak, it may lead to that clinic being very busy where other clinics are, are less so, for example. And it would allow us to examine the impacts of situating clinics within the city. Um, okay, um, and uh, this sort of uh, guidance that they receive here might be broadened to include behavioral counseling involving safe sex practices, risky behavior, which might in turn lead them to consistently use safe sex practices as opposed to intermittently or move them from at least uh, no safe sex to intermittent safe sex. Um, so that's part of the idea. Um, and uh, some of the other models like that oral trust model has a similar issue of behavioral counseling for oral health. Okay. Um, so uh, a model involving geographic space, um, people's situation in it, querying um, aspects of that, finding the nearest clinic, for example. We saw that other model moving towards uh, to the clinic on via different modes of transportation. And we could ask um, something about the distance, given that I'm limited to foot travel, um, you know, is it realistic for me to go to a clinic, for example, by foot, um, uh, if it's not in PA, but it's in Shelbrook, or if it's in Saskatoon? And, and uh, we could start to make use of GIS databases to start looking into transportation barriers to care, for example, and ask how long would it take for me to get from X to Y via my mode of transportation in a way that might change my behavior and lead me to not go for care where otherwise I would seek care. Um, these are two models making use of, of GIS data. Um, we actually uh, could examine some more, but I, I wanna jump in, jump out from those specifics to, to talk about you know, some general principles with, with GIS. Um, uh, so geographically aware models, um, are increasingly common in the age-based modeling space. Um, uh, they are quite prominent. Um, they are uh, supported by multiple platforms. So NetLogo, for example, supports them. I believe Repass does as well, as well as AnyLogic. Um, and uh, they, as I noted, they accrue all the benefits of spatially explicit models, but they have these added benefits. and. Um, and one thing I'll mention, which a, a colleague of mine um, uh, who I've mentioned many times, Jeff McDonald, once commented is that in his experience, um, there's, there's nothing that gr more, um, more um, dramatically increases uh, or notably shifts stakeholder appreciation for what's going on in an agent-based model. Appreciation for the relevance of the model, the significance, basic idea captured in the model of, of agents you know, circulating in a space that including some representation of geographic space. People see it, they recognize something that is familiar to them. They can hang their hat on that. And they get the idea that, oh, there's little people moving around within that space. Whereas, you know, a, an abstract space might not resonate with them. It, it might not, uh, it, it, they're not sure what it in the world it represents. You know, what relevance does this have to the world? This is something they can say, aha. So they are applying this model for something I recognize. Um, this, this has bearing on the world around them. Rightly or wrongly, it's a strong psychological impact. Um, and uh, I think that alone bears consideration when presenting models. Um, but there's a lot of other motivations beyond that that are really, in some sense, more substantive um, uh, in terms of the, the technical delivery of the model. Um, uh, and, and these include the fact that, for example, geographic data in GIS databases um, is one of these most potent 
readily available, easily accessible aspects of big data for ABM. I mean, um, when we think about big data for ABM, commonly we think about data associated with the four Vs. Sometimes people stick a, a fifth one on, but I think it's kind of uh, inadvise it. I think it presupposes the very value of it. Um, but uh, it, it's big, it has high velocity, it has high variety, and has high veracity. And, and GIS data here, um, sometimes we have high velocity, but at least we have the other three, uh, the high volume, the high veracity, and, and the high uh, variety. Uh, and uh, you know, bring it together with ABMs can be a very powerful enabler to, to the relevance of the ABM. Um, and geographic awareness by an ABM, the fact that it knows where PA is, Prince Albert, sorry, um, versus Saskatoon versus, um, versus Regina or Moose Jaw, the fact that it knows where these are, um, allows us to take data that's reported on a municipal basis and kind of situate it in our model. Um, we know data from the rural zone of the Saskatchewan Health Authority corresponds to this region of the province. And we can compare back and forth. Um, this may sound like a minor matter, but it's not. In short, by incorporating geographic information to the model, you can better relate its information coming from the model, better compare it, better calibrate uh, that information to, to observations in the world. Um, and all the more so when you're dealing with data from the world that is itself aspect of big data, like data from smartphones or you know, Garmin smartwatches or what have you. Um, geographically tagged tweets, et cetera. Um, so, the fact that your model knows about geography, knows about distinctions in geography, regions in geography, sort of provides you this opportunity to make use of data that is characterized as in data as increasingly is in public health geographically. And that's valuable. Um, there's also just a huge amount of resources, expertise, knowledge, libraries, databases, et cetera, in the broad geomatics area, the broad area of geographic information systems that you can leverage together with modeling in ways that are really powerful. Um, you know, so pollutant levels or walk uh, over different regions or walkability indices over different regions or, you know, bus routes over regions, um, uh, availability of grocery stores, you know, offering fresh fruits and vegetables, uh, recreational facilities, um, you can start to relate these to the models. So these are powerful things. And um, individually, they may be modest, but collectively the implications are, can be profound. They can be very significant. Um, now, what do we do with it? Like, why do I think that it can have profound implications or very significant implications? Well, there's a number of specific ways, particular mechanisms by which our models can make use of the data. I'm not speaking here about causal mechanisms, generative mechanisms, excuse me, generative pathways. I'm not, I'm not speaking about that. So I'm, I'm speaking about particular routes by which our model makes use of geographic data, particularly interfaces between the model definition and the geographic data. We saw some of them there, right? We query the database for the nearest clinic, for example. We might figure out how far that clinic is for us along the routes forced by my mode of transportation, the fact that I have to walk or what have you. I have to take public transit. Um, uh, so I might determine the distance of a resource, uh, fresh grocers, clinics and health services, et cetera, um, uh, from, from my, my location, my home base, uh, my, from my home base in my workplace or what have you. Um, uh, and often that's of real interest, whether it's you know, clinics for treatment-mediated infections like chlamydia gonorrhea or grocery stores or 
health services or access to, um, to, to you know, uh, addiction services or, or mental health counseling. These things can be important. Um, another thing is, you know, you want to figure out how much are agents being exposed to adverse resources or adverse geographic locations. We've done quite a bit with this, with data from our Ethica-based smartphone data collection system with you know, tobacco outlets and tobacco billboards in the US, um, a scourge, um, the, such billboards not seen north, uh, north of the border here, but, but we do have you know, um, ads that appear in bars or what have you for, for tobacco. Um, and you, know, you can determine sort of as people circulate how much they might plausibly see a billboard or, or tobacco out, how close they'll come to tobacco outlets and might, in a way that might shape regulation. Um, uh, we, we can consider the relative distances via different transportation modes um, as it might impact agent decision-making. So, um, uh, you know, due to, there's been a lot of interesting work done on the design of suburban neighborhoods in the U.S. And I think the same shortcomings can afflict uh, design here in Canada, whereby with suburban street design, you often get these um, hugely um, uh, distended distances from homes to uh, to particular resources of interest in terms of walking. Um, and you may not have no sidewalks or minimal sidewalks. This is, I, I've seen all that a lot more actually in the US. Here we often have sort of uh, footpaths that reliably cut through areas. But in the US, often you have to walk in these circuitous suburban kind of canyons around in order to get to a given area. And, and so, uh, you know, if you're thinking about uh, amenities like a footpath uh, that, that goes more directly or the addition of, of resources that might be provided with a pedestrian bridge over a highway or over a, over a river or what have you. Um, like in a, in a model, you could actually ask, what if we had this in place? How much would it you know, reduce those distances and maybe have some sort of simple behavioral model for how much more exercise would people get from it, for example. Um, we saw we can route agents along particular paths and that could lead them to have the opportunity to take advantage of certain resources. I know this is key to Eric and Michael's, you know, uh, trucker food stop um, modeling, but um, it could also apply for many resources with public transit or with you know, uh, routes that, that might take people past other, other resources. And you could also associate agents explicitly with nearby resources um, uh, or exposure to, for example, natural environments. Um, there's, there's some, you know, interesting work in the past half decade, particularly on the impacts of, of people being exposed to, um, to natural surrounds. Um, with footpaths through woods or through, uh, you know, a, a meadow or, or what have you, um, uh, the psychological impacts of it, um, as well as the physical health, of course, on um, reducing sedentary activity and, and recreational value of it. Um, you, you could capture some aspects of that near a person's home, for example. Um, um, uh, you know, another need that comes up is capturing risk of exposure. So we want to know how much our agents are exposed to these small particulate pollution, PPM 2.5 or radon levels um, or, you know, nitrous oxides or carbon monoxide or what have you. And um, really, that should be NOx. Uh, uh, but, but here, uh, you know, we're interested in sort of tagging them with exposure to these components. And if you have maps of where Superfund sites are, pollution are in the US, you might, you might capture something like that. And finally, uh, features or limitations in movement. There might be, if you're simulating mule deer behavior over landscape, 
for chronic wasting disease, certain terrain features might lead the deer to go certain ways and, and that concentrate their presence and lead them to have exposure to prion-based diseases or, or to deposit um, with um, undue preponderance in, in certain areas. Um, uh, so, so what does this give us? Well, uh, what are some modes that the simulation would have with respect to this data? Well, you know, one thing we've done quite a bit in our work, um, it's, I, I view it as kind of a blunt way of, of relating them is have agents be driven by empirically observed mobility patterns. So if you have mobility patterns from Ethica, our, our system, or you have mobility patterns gathered by studies of, of, of consumer driving behavior or what have you, you can kind of play it in the model and understand you know, what they're exposed to and what behavioral patterns that one might be and what might be the impact of situating a resource near that. Um, uh, or you can calibrate a model to those patterns. So you want it to be generated by the model. You want it to be endogenously produced by the model in a way that stays true to these patterns from the world. Um, or you have the simulation augmenting GIS data, for example, shedding pathogen or pollutants over time within the, uh, um, within the environment. Um, and so it, it, it associates with different areas of the map, some sort of accrued agent generated outcomes, prions or, or pollutant levels or, or um, some sort of uh, contamination from shedding, et cetera. Uh, we saw that a little bit in one of the, the spatial models where people shed, you know, could be Norwalk virus, you know, in their environment, for example. Um, and, uh, and finally, you know, we might produce data compared to geographic patterning, what we, what we see as, as patterns, not too different from the calibration idea. So I wanna talk a little bit about you know, what are some common features in GIS models? Like what are, okay, so great. You have GIS interfacing with your model. Wow, you have GIS hitched up to a model. What can we do with it? Well, um, what, what are some sort of computational ways in which they interact? We, we talked about some of the motivations, you know, ways we might use this information and, and kind of patterns that result. What are some, kind of more computational specifics of it. Well, you can load it in via databases. We saw that. We pointed to the routing server and any logic and open street maps, it loads it in. Um, we could load GIS shape files. And uh, as Wade knows in much more detail than I, there's big limitations. Uh, you can load in shape files in, in the extreme basics uh, with any logic, but really, um, you know, you'd want to think about uh, broader GIS libraries um, uh, for that. It may be NetLogo offers some advantages uh, here. I don't know, but GIS shape files can be um, put together that have lots of information, pollutant levels in different places. And, and there's a wonderful wealth of GIS libraries and software, um, uh, software libraries that could be called potentially by simulations to sort of load that in and query it and make use of it. Um, uh, and, you know, commonly these models make use of continuous space, uh, and travel within continuous space. Um, and often agents will have latitude and longitude of a certain heading, a certain direction, which they're headed just like with your G GPS system on your phone, and it will sort of point in the direction it thinks you're, you're headed. Um, and you know there'll be a bunch of resources around. And you, you will commonly query the GIS data for particular information and request you know, agent movement from place, um, 
y to play z or what have you to move um, uh, to move within that that space. So the gives you know a little bit of flavor of what it's like perhaps to work with that data. Um, there's some pragmatics. So GIS features do not come for free. Um, far from it. They actually impose significant added computational time, network use. And um, if you're not careful and you load a large database in, you know, you, you might have a lot of memory use because of it. If you load a shape file in something, it may be that it has a significant memory component. So, you know, there's benefits, but there's trade-offs here. There's there's things you want to be aware of. And um, one thing that I know a number of our models have used, I know Eric and, and Michael have used it most notably, I think our earlier work on chronic waste, wasting disease, excuse me, also made use of it. Um, but rather than going over the network, going over and requesting, for example, any logic servers to routes, to get the information needed to route someone from A to B, um, from their home to the SDI clinic or something like that. Um, uh, instead, you, you have to have make information on the local computer so it doesn't need to request it via the network. Going over a network is very slow in general and it can be deathly slow and it's uh, a point of encumbrance of risk of potential failure if you know there's network problems or if certain certain actors you know, try to cut undersea cables or what have you and um and using cached gis databases databases sorry the word cached is a term of art but basically it means databases that are stored locally where you don't have to go over the network um they're they're kind of you have a copy, a local copy of them that's extra fast. That's what a cache is. Um, uh, and, um, and, and therefore you can just access it on your computer and it can be vastly faster when you use a GIS cache than compared to making a request for routing um, to another server. Um, now, there's some intelligence here and if you query, one thing and then you come back and query it later it may be normally cached as part of any logic's normal operation but in general you might save a lot of time and in, in if you're querying unique things many times to have that the information needed to answer those queries you know how long how large is the distance from a to b by foot for example or take me from a to b on on a bike path or whatever it, it can be much better to have that information locally. So geographic information systems um, and agent-based models. Um, these can be a potent combination and you know, can allow you to really tap into the richness of understanding um, uh, that is available with respect to manipulating geographical information online, um, uh, or I shouldn't say online, ma manipulating geographic information. Um, the sky's the limit here. This book is still being written. Um, I think we're in the early stages of the collision of these two technologies. Um, the models that we've used haven't nearly tapped the full richness, um, but, uh, there's a lot of exciting developments to be um, to be tapped and 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 potential to be addressed um, and to be realized uh, in this area. So those are some thoughts in geographic data. I, I wish um, I could expand that into a full lecture and perhaps the next time I offer this class, maybe next year I will. but um, uh, those are some comments uh, with brevity. Um, on a subject that I think future years will see um, great, great expansion, particularly as big data and geotag data um, uh, capture more and more attention. If anyone's interested in that, um, 
glad to to chat more about it. But um, 